Well, welcome back to the Sean Trey Show. Today, I have a really interesting guest with me. Now, would you like to tell people who you are and what you do? Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Yari Davidson, and I am a cinematographer here in Toronto, Canada. Nice. Now, now, how how long have you been doing cinematography? Uh, well, this is my second life. This is my second career. I've been doing it professionally. About I love that. Uh, yeah, about 15 years now. So yeah, 15 years. That's awesome. Now, so that, 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 that sets up an interesting story right there. I want to go back. How did you get into cinematography then? Well, I went back to university as a mature student. Um, I didn't go to film school. Uh, I graduated from Western university here in Ontario in London, London, Ontario. And, uh, Mm -hmm. the faculty I graduated from was called media information and technoculture. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, talking about semiotics, talking about uh, global media, um, hegemony, all of these, all of these constructs and, and sort of power structures we have in the world. So I think it's an interesting, I come from an interesting background to, that I can apply to my work as a cinematographer. That's really interesting because mm. if you're, if you're just coming from a technical standpoint, there's not always that. Let me, let me take a step back. I think something that a lot of people don't really understand is the absolute importance that the cinematographer has to the storytelling of a film, because there's so much that goes into it. Have you, have you watched uh, last night? I'm, 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 I'm I'm still reeling from how much I love this movie. I watched the movie old Henry last night. Have you seen it yet? I have not. Oh, you got to watch it. Great. I won't say any more. It is a phenomenal Western, but the cinematography was stunning absolutely stunning and and the story was so much better because of that now how how do some of these concepts help you with your cinematography that's a really interesting concept well to 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 further the question that you had for me how did i originally get into this um again i I went back to school as a mature student um and i took a film 101 class um Mm. and i watched a um an old Soviet film. And I ended up staying after class and talking to my professor for about four hours after watching Eisenstein's October. And I was just absolutely oh, nice. mesmerized by the images on this fit on this film. It was a silent film. And uh, I said, who does that? I said, is that the director? And he said, no, well, that's the cinematographer that makes these types of images. And I, something I had an epiphany. It's like, I, I don't know how to do that. It, I didn't know one person in this business. I lived four hours away from Toronto uh, in a small town. And I said, I have to do that. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know anything about it, but that's what I, what I plan to do. So to your next point, um, how does that, how does, how does my education um, help with uh, what I do as a cinematographer today? Um, I find myself, I try not to get bogged down in the technology uh, because technology is always mm. evolving. And I think yes. that, uh, yeah. the tools we have available to us help us do our jobs um, to, to a certain degree. But if we're not bringing our imagination and our storytelling ability uh, to the work that we're doing, I think all of these fancy tools are essentially useless in, in my, in my humble opinion. And um, so funny you ask because uh how what what you know this experience bring brings to my work i actually came from the music business as well uh so i sang in a band for for the first part of my life and i was on the road and touring and we put out albums and independent band and made a living off it i wasn't a millionaire but i made enough to to make a living and pay my rent off it so i i bring a lot of that um lyrical nature and sort of that layered, uh, dynamic nature to my work as well. Um, so I think, I think all of these things sort of inform, inform us as creatives and and what we've gone through our life experiences. We bring all of that to our work, whether we, whether we think we do or or we don't. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's such a good point. And I think that there was this great, I was a history major in university and I, um, I jumped around with a bunch of majors, but the history department allowed me to read and that I loved. 
And that was like, I was like, I can just study whatever I want and read books. And they're like, yeah, what any books you want? I said, well, this is phenomenal. And I love this. In the English department, I have to write all these expositions on the books. With the history department, I just had to kind of kind of figure out what was going on historically at that time. There was this, this, this interesting point that like, when, when I got to the, the higher levels of, of what I was studying, one of the things that they pointed out is that when people would write a story or write about history or write things or, or create a project, we always think that we're kind of standing outside of our perspective, but no one is. We're all kind of, we're all in a time, in a culture, in a place, and anything that we do kind of, sh that we create is shaped by those things. And that there are these these overall perspectives that we have, you know, and living outside the U.S. now, I see, wow, I grew up American and that's a perspective that I have. But when I move back to the U.S. someday, I won't necessarily be the same because I've spent half my life in Asia. You know, there are these different things that shape us. And I think it's powerful when people begin to understand the strengths of those things and can use it to their own advantage. Yeah, we as, as certainly we, we view the world through a lens, right? And all of our understanding yes. <laughs> and our interpretation um, of the world is, is put through a frame, the frame of our experience, right? Mm -hmm. Speaking mm -hmm. of lenses, uh, how do you go about, I mean, first of all, I got to point out, I love the Ansel Adams photo behind you. Or the poster oh, yeah, behind you. that's my, that's my feng shui uh, to help me make good decisions while I'm in my office. So, right. Yeah. Are you, are you, are you a huge Ansel Adams fan? Are you inspired by his work? I am. I love the zone system. Um, I, I love, yeah, love a lot of his photography. Um, yeah, very inspiring. That's awesome. And, and, you know, his no, whole, no. his whole concept was, uh, to pre visualize the work, um, before mm -hmm. he clicked the shutter. And I'm a big proponent of that. I try to teach my students that is, and that's what my mentors have passed down to me is, um, a lot of cinematography is to use our imaginations to pre, pre visualize what it is that we hope to accomplish. And then by utilizing the tools that we have available to us is to actually execute that vision. So, yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. Th there was, this was something that my dad was a photographer and when I was growing up, I still shoot on film. I, I have, a, I have, a, I went to the zoo today with my daughter and I shot a bunch of roles Great. of film and um one of the things that was interesting and that you know I, I love about it is that i i had to plan my shots i really had to think about what i was going to take a photo of and how i was going to put it together because you don't have a lot of time you don't have a lot of chances you have 36 shots if it's a <laughs> you sometimes might have 24 right. right you know and that's that's what you're getting and you have to really plan versus one of the challenges with, as we've gone into the digital realm is that I, I was working with some young, some young guys here who are really talented, really amazing. And they were shooting for my wife and I for a music video. And I was like, well, what, what's your shot? I'm just going to move around and see what I get. <laughs> right. Let's, well, let's well, plan. Well, I got a gimbal. I got a gimbal. It's okay. No. Right. Well, it's the old analogy. Uh, I've seen these memes on, on the internet and they made me laugh. It says, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a photo of a canister of film and it says 36 exposures, two good shots. And then it has a CF card yeah. next to it. And it says 30,000 exposures, two good shots, two good shots. <laughs> right. Totally. So I've never whole... seen that one, but I totally believe it. Yeah. That's the whole analogy of that. So, yeah. How how did you go about? What were some what were some of the lessons that your mentors taught you that that created this foundation of of really planning things out for you? Um, well, one of one of my mentors, um, he really and he's a very accomplished uh, cinematographer here in Canada, and he he taught me to use my imagination and to not focus so much on the resources that we don't have to create the project. Mm. Yeah. But what it is that we do have and how we, you know, the, the idea to really pre visualize and use your imagination, how can we manipulate the situation that we're in, whether using natural light or bl the blocking or the staging, um, of our, of our actors, um, 
it's really, really focused on that. And, and it's, it's stuck with me my, basically my entire career. And I really built that foundation on, again, not focusing on what we don't have, but focusing on what we do have and how we can, how I can use what we, the tools and resources we have available to us in order to um, execute the vision that I have in my mind. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, do you, do you rely a lot on storyboarding? How do you go about your visualization process? Do you try to find images or is it all kind of mental images that you put together? Um, so I have, I much like any artist, I have my own process and it's, it's been tried mm -hmm. and true over all these years of, of, I'm a big proponent of failing forward of, of being brave and not, that. Being, <laughs> not being, afraid. and I'll get into that later. I'm a huge proponent of that of not being afraid to fail. Uh, the only reason I am where I am in my career is because I've just failed a lot more than other people have. Um, I don't know if that's bravery or stupidity or what it was, but I just, I just wanted to do it so badly, um, that I wasn't afraid of failing. Um, and so to, you know, to arrive at these images, um, I typically, I, I work in the feature film world. That's where I do most of my work. I try to stay out of television, um, but I do feature films. I do music videos. I do some commercial work as well. But when it comes to narrative filmmaking, I, I read the script at least three times. Uh, the first time I read it as a spectator and I just, I ask myself, would I, would I pay $15 to go and see this movie in the theater? That's the first time. Do I, do I enjoy it as a, as a spectator? The second time yeah. I read it, um, I look at more, look at it more from a story perspective. I analyze the characters, mm -hmm. um, the themes, any motifs that are in it, uh, sort of the, the narrative trajectory of these characters and how they've changed throughout it. And then only the third time, um, and I really try to hold myself back from imposing a style to the, to the work uh, until this third time that I read the script. And then when I read the script the third time, then I permit myself to start making notes in the, in the margins. Mm -hmm. I like to work tactilely. I, I still print out my scripts on paper and scribble all over it. Um, and then, you know, I do put together a, a lookbook. I, I like to go, I, I use a lot of paintings. I use a lot of photographers and I sometimes use films, but I try to stay away from using films as, as touchstones and references. Um, mm -hmm. So I bring that to the meeting with the director and then I will ask the director for their touchstones. I, I say to them, what, what does the, in your mind, what are the five films that you could say this, this film that we're trying to, we're hoping to create is an amalgam. What five films would that be? Um, and I start from there and, you know, I have a collection, huge physical media collection. I have like 2000 Blu-rays in my office and, and I typically ha nice. most likely have those titles that they mention. So I come in my office and I pull them off the shelf and I'll sit down and I'll watch them. Uh, not in a, not in a way that I'm trying to, um, you know, emulate these films or copy from these films, but I just let them seep in. And then I have these discussions yeah. with the director based on the, the mood boards and the, the vision boards that, that, that I've come up with. And I really like to hear uh, no, or I hate that from a director uh, because it, it, that helps mm -hmm. me. I start very wide. I cast a wide net at the beginning and the more conversations we have and the more we look at these, these images together as inspiration, the more I can hone that down and, uh, yeah. and have a really crystalline vision of, of how this film should, should be. And then when I get there on the first day, I kind of just throw that book in the garbage and I just start shooting the movie. <laughs> like, really, I go through this like really intense, uh, pre-production. I, I think that's where, um, the old adage, fix it and prep, uh, fix it in yeah. post. I flipped it on its ear and it's fix it in prep. So that's for me, that's really when the film comes alive. Um, and then when I start on day one, like I said, I just throw the book away and, and start shooting the movie. Cause in that, by that point it's, I've already ingested it. It's already become part of me and I sort of understand. And then the film, again, I, I never try to impose a style on a film. The film tells me what yeah. it wants to be. I know that sounds like an esoteric no, 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 sense. way of approaching it. Um, but again, I never want to impose an aesthetic on, on a piece of work. It always informs me how it should be told. And, uh, yeah, I think cinematography should be invisible. Um, 
I think the, the touchstone that I use at the end of a project with a director is, did we create a world? That's my, that's my catchphrase. And it's important to me. Uh, I like that. Yeah. And, um, all of this is part and parcel to the whole creative process. And, and, uh, so that's, yeah, that was a long winded answer to answer your question of how I arrive at these images. And that's kind of my workflow. Yeah. There was the, the, I love that prep and throw it all away. I was a, I'm I'm a, I'm a black belt in judo. And one of my favorite books coming up was a, a book called Zen in the Art of Archery. And it was by Eugene Harrigal. And I don't know if you ever read that one, but it was essentially the journey of this. This guy was living in, in Japan and he was learning the Japanese art of, of archery. And if you ever watch the videos of, of, of their archery class, like for the first however many years, and he talks about this, like the teacher would tell him, don't focus on the target. You're not aiming. Focus on the technique of the draw. And then you hold it and release and it was there was this whole art to the release and like and this guy was coming from the western perspective and he's like i need to focus on getting things done on this and the guy's like focus on the process yep. it is all about the process and then there was this idea uh, 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 in zen in the zen in arts of this motion you get to this point of preparation of, of all this work that you put in for the years and then all of a sudden you get to this point of absolutely letting go and the motion is kind of like the beginner's mind and you go at it and you're like just let's let it go and how are we going to approach it today because today i've done the work now it's to get into it and so what you described reminded me of that it's this do the process and then be ready to go right because i think you know in my narrative filmmaking and in my in my filmmaking and in in my work I'm afraid to squeeze the life and the organic nature out of the work itself if I'm too rigid with it and it becomes too much of a process. And that's why, like I said, I like to prep and be very intense and very focused at the beginning and then just throw it all away and just go and shoot it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's worked for me so so far. I I love, I love the process. Yeah. And I think that that's the other thing too, is it's like, if you create something that works for you, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know, it, it just, you, you, when you find that magic, that magic recipe, keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> there was this, um, there was, someone was telling me about, there was this famous, um, this famous place, uh, in Nashville that had this, um, it's this place that was famous for its chicken. Okay. And they had, it was like the most famous chicken in Nashville. And they had this fried chicken that was delicious and they tried to open another restaurant what they found out was the, the, another restaurant. People were complaining. It doesn't taste as good as the first place. You know why? It was the cast iron skillet that they were using at the old restaurant that they'd been using for, for 25 years. Sure. And that, that cast iron skillet had the flavor. And when they started this new place, they didn't have that skillet. It was this, this big old skillet. And, and like, that was why the chicken tasted so good. And so sometimes when you have something that works, it's got that special sauce to it, you know? Yep. That's it. It's got the magic in it, right? No, it's got the magic in it. That's it. Now, um, failing forward. I want to dive into failing forward. Now, now how, how did you come about? Was this something that you always embraced or were there some events in your life that kind of, kicked you into this, this approach to life? Wow. That's a deep question. Um, I, I certainly, I certainly think, um, you know, due to the business that we're in, uh, in the, in the entertainment business, uh, I hear no, I hear more no's before nine o'clock than most people hear in their entire year. And to me, I've just, it's, it's kind of, um, it's, I think it's, I think it's a result of that uh, culture that, that we're working in. Um, and it's all part of that persistence. Um, yeah. And whether that persistence comes from whether that, uh, you know, that those barriers come from outside in the industry, in this competitive industry that we work in, or whether those barriers come from inside our, our minds, our own thought processes, um, 
that's where the concept of failing forward comes for me is uh, you're never going to get it right at the beginning and it is all part of the process. Right. So yeah, a lot of people don't even start their journey because it has to be perfect. It has to be, I have to do this perfect thing and all the stars have to line up and it has to be done a certain way. And they're too afraid that they might be judged or they might be looked down upon, or they might not break through and be this instant overnight success that they think there's some, there's some illusion that this is going to happen. And it does happen. It does happen in the world to one out of a million people. Um, but for Mm -hmm. the rest of us, you just have to put in the work and, and, uh, yeah, as you were saying from the, from the book about, about the archery, uh, focus on the process and yeah, don't do it for the money or don't do it for the awards. Um, if you really say that you love something and you have to do it more than you need the breath in your lungs, yeah, you'll figure out a way, you'll figure out a way to do it or you won't. Right. And that's okay too. Like everyone has their own path in life. Um, I just learned early on, you know, and I, I definitely jumped off the cliff and built my wings on the way down. I, I'll have to admit that. I, I don't love know. that. Yeah, I definitely did. I because, love that. Um, I saw that screening. And like I said, I didn't know one person in this business. I didn't know anything about cameras. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I didn't know one person. I didn't know anything about it. And I just said, that's what I'm doing. And people are like, you're absolutely insane. Uh, and here I am, you know, 15 feature films later, my work's being shown all over the world. I've shot for all the major labels, Fortune 500 companies. And it's just really... Uh, being fearless. Right. And, and, um, yeah. and just going for it. So I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of that. And I try to, um, I try to let young people know when people that come to me for my advice is, uh, the only competition you have is the person that you're looking at in the mirror every morning when you brush your teeth. Yeah. So if you yeah. can be better than you were yesterday, that's, that's, that's what you have to go for. I love that. Yeah. I, 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 I absolutely, hundred percent love that concept. My friend once had this dream and was my roommate at the time. And he was telling me about the dream afterwards. And he was like, Sean, I had this dream about you. It was about me. And it's like you, there was a cliff. We were both standing at the cliff and I looked over the edge and I was like, I'm going to die if I jump off that cliff. And you came running up from behind me and just dove off the cliff. And he was like, I was like, Oh my gosh, Sean just died. And then you climbed up and looked at me and said, what are you waiting for? And he's like, I've never known something that defines you so well. And I was like, that is the coolest thing anyone has ever said to me. Because I think that like, we should all try to dive off. You know, it's, it, 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 you don't know what type of cool things wait for you, but sometimes, and I've never heard your statement. You have to, to build your wings and learn to fly on the way down. Brilliant. Yep. Because why not? Right. Yeah. It, I, I started this podcast a couple of months ago, just a couple of months. I, long, long history of production, long history of, of, I've been doing video production for 15 plus years, you know? And, and so it was the first time I was really diving in and doing something uniquely for me. And I was going back through my, the first episodes and I was like, man, I, I, I've improved a lot, but every single video I do, I try to get better and better. I'm better. And as you should, just, you got to lean into it. Right. Um, yeah, they call, it, they call it the plateau. We think that we're going to just going to escalate into stardom and then you, you get to the realization that that's not going to happen. And no. so then you, 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 you reach this precipice, you're, you're at the crossroads and it's like, do I continue or do I lean into it? And I believe if, if you're destined to do this and your soul is telling you that this is the journey that you need to go on, you need to lean into it and appreciate 100%. the journey and, and appreciate the process. Right. Yeah. I, I, again, like I said, I was judo black, I'm a judo black boat. And one of the things I love about judo over other martial arts is that with judo, you get a black belt from getting your ass thrown on the ground hundreds, thousands of times. Yep. And I remember my first day in judo and my teacher looked at me and said, first thing you're going to do today, I was like, what? I'm going to learn to kick. I'm going to learn to punch. I'm going to learn to throw someone. He's like, you're going to learn to fall. 
sure. because you're going to fall many, many, many times. And the most important thing when you fall is that you get back up. That's it. That's it. You dust yourself off, you stand up. And I think if there's anything I learned in martial arts, it was just to get back up. And I, I'm keeping a list of, of responses that I get because most people that I message to come on, I never, never hear back. It's, you know, 90, 95%, there's no response. 3% are just the most wonderful cordial people. 2% people can be kind of, kind of cold sometimes. And every single one of those, I take a screenshot and I go, this, this is why I got to be better. Not anything about them. This is why I have to be better sure. because I have to show myself to overcome any of these, these, these things like, oh, this, oh, that. And it's just like, use it as fuel. Use every time you fall down as fuel, not anger, not negativity, but just because, you know what? This is a good point. It, it, it's like, I think like if someone doesn't like, like you said, thousand no's before, a hundred no's before breakfast, you know what I mean? Before 9 a.m. And some of those are really important for you to become better. Yeah. You know, some of them are horrible. And, and I think that the idea of, of, it's not just about negative responses. It's about also, it's a demanding craft and the expectations are exceptionally high. You know, because let's be real, people are investing a lot of money in these right. projects. That's right. And they want it back. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And, you know, as the director of photography, as the cinematographer, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of responsibility on my shoulders. Um, yeah. not only do I have the fiscal responsibility to the producer that's gone ahead and developed yep. this project and went out and got it financed uh, and hopes to exploit it to, to get that back to their investors. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have, you know, I have a responsibility to the director uh, mm -hmm. to execute their vision based on the resources that the producer has available to us. Uh, and I also have a yeah. responsibility to the audience as well. So it's, it's, yeah, it's very, it's very stressful, but it's also the most incredible thing I've done okay. in my life. It's yeah, the bug bit me and, uh, it's just magic to me. And, and I, it's insanity, but I also is, there's just something captivating it, it that, that I was put here to do this. So I continue to put one foot in front of the other and, and, and do it daily. What, what, what's your process for when you get onto a film, how do you go about choosing your shots, choosing things. How, you, you read through the script, but how do you go about f crafting your narrative once you've moved on to the set? Well, going back to um, when I talked about my process earlier in prep, what I do the like planning, to do, yeah. what I do like to do is, is create a set of rules for myself. Oh, um, I like that. And how I'm going to approach the film. That I don't throw away, but that list of rules is very short. I usually keep it in my phone. Sometimes I actually write an essay to myself after I've gone through this, mm. this prep process with the director and I really understand, I try to understand that the film we're, we're, we're about to make. And I'll write an essay to myself, basically saying, this is the film, this is my understanding of it. These are the tools I have available to me. And these are the tools that I'm going to apply in order to tell that story visually. And when I do that, I distill that down into a very short list of rules that I will apply to the project. Maybe it's, we're only going to use one lens or when this character is in the frame, it's going to be handheld or it's all situational. It's all dependent on the narrative. Um, that's, that's cool. I've never, I've never heard that before. And that's really special. Yeah. A list of rules for that film, because it makes sense though, you know, it, it, if I were to think of, you know, a movie like Cloverfield or um, Blair Witch, those are going to have very obvious rules. You know, uh, the situation needs to feel shaky. And that's why there is that that handheld type, you know, uh, cinematography sure. and um, versus um, uh, Quentin Tarantino's Hateful Eight, where he uses those really 
epic wide shots, you know, and everything's very cinematic. It's, it's a completely different approach and it would have different rules. Yeah. So that's, that's typically, you know, how I do it. I, there's this really focused period, intense period of preparation. I throw that away. I distill it down into this very short list of rules. And then once I get there, and this comes, I, I think a lot of this helps uh, from my music background as well. I, I work very intuitively. Um, again, I, I don't want to crush the magic out of it. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to capture the magic in a bottle and be able to show the bottle to people. So when I'm there, I work very intuitively and I try not to get in my own way of capturing the magic that's already there. And I, and I allow the the director to work with the actors and I watch the actors and the energy in the room informs me, informs me of the way that I should be capturing this certain scene or, and then, like I said, I'll refer back to my very short list every once in a while, just to remind myself, Oh, this character is in the shot. We should be handheld. So let's start with that. And then I watch the blocking and it typically, you know, I don't really shot list. I don't like shot lists. I don't storyboard. I think it's all the magic is in the room with the the actors in their wardrobe in the space that, that we've chosen to shoot in with the the production design. And that really informs me that again, the situation informs me how the film should be shot. So it's an intuitive work way of working. Yeah. Well, I I love that. Two things you said there that I really want to unpack. One of the ideas is I love that you came from music and you moved into film. Because I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand. Like, imagine that Jimi Hendrix's bandmates were like, hey, Jimmy, we need to finish the song at 345. You know, you shouldn't be having an extra long guitar solo. You know, like, you can't do that to Jimi Hendrix. Right. You know, and, and, you know, and the same thing is different actors approach things different way. Different directors approach things different way. You have to have a degree of flexibility to be able to adapt to that, you know. So that's that's really special. And... Um, yeah, I, I really, I really find that fascinating. Now, can you talk to me about what are some of the films that inspire you? What are some of the, the, the projects that are, or, 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 or film artwork or photographers that you go back and go, yeah, this is, this is stuff that I, that, that feeds your inspiration. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of, uh, sort of seventies, 70s and 80s American cinema, sort of independent American nice. cinema. Um, mm-hmm. I like a lot of foreign cinema from the same sort of time time period, 60s, 70s, mm-hmm. 80s. That's my that's my jam. Really independent cinema. Um, mm-hmm. I do a lot of um, my work is mainly in horror. I do a lot of horror films. I do a lot of dark subject matter. Um, Okay. And so a lot of those films from the seventies and eighties, um, you know, all, all the masters, George Romero, group. Yeah. um, George Romero, John Carpenter, um, a mm-hmm. lot of Italian cinema, a lot of Japanese cinema. Um, so mm-hmm. it, it, it's, I have an interesting, I think I have a very eclectic a taste when it comes to both films and music because I'll oscillate between, uh, art house films. And then I watch, you know, classic horror cinema, which you wouldn't normally put those mm-hmm. two together. Um, and the same with my taste in music as, as well. One day I'll be listening to jazz and the next day I'll be listening to death metal. Right. So it's really, I, I feel you. I, I don't think we should judge anything. If, if, uh, if we're artists and we're creators, we should be able to appreciate whatever an artist is laying down. Um, so yeah. Um, you know, I could come up with a list. I, people have asked me, Oh, what's your favorite film or what's, you know, particularly inspiring to you. I just, uh, again, I have a huge collection, uh, and it's all really just independent cinema. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. From the sixties and seventies, American cinema, Japanese stuff, like Italian stuff. Um, nice. Yeah. I mean, but either that, especially the sixties and seventies for, I, I'm a huge fan of Japanese cinema and, you know, I'm 
huge Kurosawa fan and yep. not just Kurosawa, but like, I, I, I loved a lot of the different directors from that time period. And uh, talk about, I was watching this, this great, great, um, YouTube video about the movement in Kurosawa, just like just the movement happening on screen, not, not including the camera movement, but how, mm. how he worked with, with directions. And it was just like people, some of those people were just masters of their craft. And that's just one person, you know, it, 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 an absolute master of an understanding of what they were doing. And I think it's just, it's so powerful. That, that's one of the, the things that I've learned on this podcast is as I've been speaking with people who are really amazing at what they do, and not all of them are, are experts of their field, but they're, they have their own set of knowledge and their own, their own wisdom that they've brought with them from their own lives. And it's just, it, I thought I had things figured out. <laughs> I thought that I had a degree of knowledge, but I'm, I'm, every time I talk to them, I go, wow, I, uh, I was operating inside my own box. And sometimes we don't realize we're in that box until, until we get it blasted open by something. And, and it's phenomenal to, to, to have these people that can kind of inspire us. Now, if you were to go back to a younger version of yourself, what, what advice would you give yourself on your journey, your creative journey, whether that be film, music, whatever you want? Um, that it's all going to work out. Hmm. And this goes back to failing forward. This going goes back to being brave because, um, you know, when I began this journey, the types of, the types of creativity that I was, um, you know, I was inspired by punk rock. I was inspired by the punk rock ethic. I was really into that subculture and it was mm -hmm. not, it was not, um, a widely accepted thing when, <laughs> when I began this journey, right. It was really frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Right. And now we're, we're in this, you know, we're in this world today where I think everyone's we're, we're striving towards a place where everyone is able to be themselves. Right. But when I started yeah. this journey, I was very fearful, uh, deep down inside and I was questioning myself and, you know, I was always on the fringes, I was marginalized, mm -hmm. right? Because of the type of art mm -hmm. that I was consuming and it was, and was inspired by, right? John Waters and, you know, different filmmakers, right? And it was kind of fringe stuff and I, it was frowned upon. Um, so if I was to give any advice to myself then it, it's, it's all going to work out and you just have to, um, look beyond the challenges of, of embracing this journey and that, um, if you just stay the path on this creative journey to express yourself, I think we're all put here for a reason. Um, and yeah. again, I know that sounds like a universal truth yeah, that you hear. I, I like think it. we're all here for a reason. And, uh, and, and the reason for us being here is to each one of us as an individual, uh, with our own unique voice and our own unique gift. And, I see a lot of people going through their lives and not giving their gift that they've been given to the world. Right. And yes. I think that's, I think that's sad. And I think that's a shame. So if I was to give any advice, um, because now the tides have kind of turned, right. And now the things that I'm into and the type of art and creativity that I'm putting out in the world, people are actually coming to me and say, this is amazing. This I'm so inspired by this. And, uh, that's, you know, it's interesting that we met on social media. Uh, yeah. And I, I think people are, are missing that, the, the aspect of that it's called social media for a reason that, that we're there yeah. to, to put ourselves out into the world and find yeah. other people that, that, you know, um, are in tune with what we're doing and, uh, yes. and put more goodness out into the world and put more creativity out into the world. Exactly. And that, that was what I was telling you before we got started on here is my whole point for this podcast was simply to kind of spread, to get people inspired, to put out their own stuff. Yep. The, the, there's, there is, there was a great couple songwriters that I had on and, and one girl that was just the other day and I interviewed her and phenomenal songwriter. And she sits on all this music. She's just sitting on it. 
And she was like, I, I just felt that it wasn't good enough. And it was amazing. And it's just like, get it out. Yep. Get it out to the world because the world needs your voice. The That's world it. needs these voices. 100%. Because like you, if we don't share it, then there was this, I, I'm a, I, I was a philosophy. I, my, 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 I studied history with emphasis in philosophy. And there was like one of the, 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 the holy books of India, the Bhagavad Gita. And they talks about this one line. And it's like, this kid's asking, like, he's like, why should I do this? And he's like, you can go, you can be, a, I'm going to paraphrase, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be this and that. But if that's not your calling, it doesn't matter how perfectly you do it. Because if you are not fulfilling your calling, whatever that might be, the world is losing something. That's it. So it's better to try it, try what you think is your calling and fail miserably than to do something else that's not meant for you. That's it. Yeah, because maybe maybe that is maybe that is your purpose. Maybe maybe your purpose isn't to be this world famous artist winning all these awards and accolades and and being a multimillionaire from your work. Maybe your maybe your purpose as an artist is to channel what you're here to do and inspire someone else that's going to become yeah. something else. Right. Who are we to say what our purpose is here? You know, yes. I think I think our whole point of existence of us being here is we're just extensions of the universe itself. Right. It's all part yeah. of the unified field. Right. So yep. it's just ways of the universe to experience itself and and to. Yeah, that's, you know, who are we to say what we. Where this journey is going to take us and you just can't be fearful of the journey. You have to be brave and you got to put yourself out there and. and do it like what work intuitively and what your soul is telling you to do. I think that's a, a good way to approach it. And, and what do you have to lose? That's you know, it. like what do you have to lose? You know, maybe you get rejected. Well, wouldn't you prefer to be rejected once or twice or a thousand times instead of being miserable <laughs> you know? or, 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 or miserably or comfortable up, or waking up with regret, yeah. right? I've seen people at the yeah. end of their lives with regret and it's the most horrible thing that I've seen. It's the most horrible way to end this experience. Right. Right. And I just, I gave it my all. Yeah. As I think what most people want to be able to say, yep. I gave it my all. Yeah. Every day, every day, every, yeah. every day again and again. And even when that wasn't good enough, I sure enjoyed it. That's it. Yeah. 100%. Well, I, I think that's, that's powerful wisdom, my friend. It's powerful wisdom. Now, do you have any other last tidbits that you'd like to drop on people before we finish up? Uh, well, you know, I think, you know, I'm speaking from a cinematographer's point of view. This can, I can give advice to, um, emerging cinematographers, emerging filmmakers, but I think this goes, goes well for that. all, for all artists. Um, it's so true. And, uh, I've just got some notes here. Uh, the biggest one fail forward, right? As we discussed earlier, you have to be brave. There's never going to be a perfect time. All the things yeah. aren't going to line up for you. You have to fail forward. You cannot be afraid of failure or judgment. Um, you need to just lean into it and, and, uh, the path to get to the end of your journey is by those, those steps that you're going to take. And you're going to learn, learn way more by failing than you will by succeeding. And so each one of those small failures, if you can just take one little nugget that worked well and allow those to all those nuggets to coalesce over years, then you will yep. get to where you want to go. Right. And my next piece of advice is, um, <clears throat> It's a, and it's part of a long, long sentence is they're going, here. they're going to judge you anyways. So just be yourself. Right. Yeah. And this goes back to the advice I would have given my younger self is, um, your work isn't for everyone. Right. Yeah. But there's, yeah. billi there's billions of people on this planet and there's, there are people in the world 
that are going to like your work and appreciate your work and really get inspired and, and activated by your work. So don't chase. You need to attract. You need to put the vibes out into the world oh, that yeah. it's like, this is my work. I'm not going to be afraid to put it out there. And the right people are going to find you. And that sort of leads me into my last piece of advice would be find your tribe, right? Because yes. again, and I, these sound like universal truths and you've heard them a million no, times. No, you've seen them in memes. No, um, no, I love it, man. Yeah. So find your tribe. It's, you don't have to impress everyone on the planet. You only have to impress the people. You have to put your work out there and the right people will find you. And then you can all be inspired and, and energized together. And for the rest of the people that yeah. don't get what you're trying to do, it's not for them. And you just let it roll off your shoulder and they can go find what inspires them. Right. But again, if you don't fail forward, if you're not brave to put yourself out there, you won't have this, you won't um, create this environment that's conducive to attracting the right energy into your life. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't sound like universal truths. Well, the reason I'm excited is because you're just reinforcing the wisdom that I've been having circulate back for myself recently. And so it's almost like you said, it's the universe kind of expressing itself. I really do feel like the right information comes at the right time that we need to hear. And I think that that's kind of, that's kind of how it plays full circle for me. So I appreciate this advice beyond measure today. So I want to say thank you. Great. Thank you thank for coming you. on. Thank you for being willing to share. Thanks for having me, Sean. I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh...